Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's clinical webcast, Post-Refractive IOL Calculations with the Pinnacam AXL. To start, I'd like to point out that you have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter questions. Please type in your questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we'll have some time to discuss them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker this evening is Dr. George Waring IV. Dr. Waring is a diplomat of the American Board of Ophthalmology and a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. He is the founder and medical director of the Waring Vision Institute in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Dr. Waring has also served as associate professor of ophthalmology at the Medical University of South Carolina. He's served as adjunct assistant professor of bioengineering at the College of Engineering and Science at Clemson University, and as clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Emory University School of Medicine. He is also credited with over 100 scientific publications and has lectured around the world as an expert in refractive and cataract surgery. It's an honor to have Dr. Waring on tonight's webcast, and on behalf of Oculus, I'd like to express our gratitude for his time and efforts. I'd also like to thank everybody in attendance for their time tonight. So now, without further delay, I would like to hand it over to Dr. George Waring. Thank you, Chris, and I'd like to thank Oculus for the opportunity to present the Pentacam AXL and, and post-refractive IOL calculations with this device. I am a consultant and a speaker for Oculus. We're all used to seeing these images, and this is a Scheinflug tomography of the anterior segment with the Pentacam AXL, and what you've just noticed in this motion is essentially a rotation of the tomographer that allows for a 3D reconstruction of the anterior segment. And this is done with high fidelity in a high resolution fashion. And we can take advantage of this to remodel and plan our treatments accordingly in circumstances such as the post-refractive eye. In addition, with the Pentacam AXL, not only is this a high resolution tomographer, but this also has a partial coherence laser interferometer added to the device that allows for high resolution optical biometry. In our center, we've uh, conducted uh, the pilot trials and validations against the uh, IOL uh, Master 500 and found excellent uh, correlation in the axial length. This is very useful in that this creates an opportunity for integrating not only keratometry, but also axial length um, uh, in a high resolution fashion. And this also allows us to screen for corneal abnormalities and pathology, uh, aids in lens selection by combining the two parameters, allows for IOL power calculations for all eye types, generates a total corneal power for the treatment of astigmatism, utilizing both the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces. And then also integrates with additional technologies uh, through streaming, such as Lens AR and True Vision, and can also uh, easily allow us to optimize our lens constants. Many of you may be familiar with this technology, which uh, is intuitive in terms of determining what parameters are normal and fall outside of a normal range. Quite simply, if it's green, it's within a, a, a normal range. If it's yellow, it's one standard deviation outside of a normative database. And if it's red, it's two standard deviations outside of a normal da normative database. And we can utilize this in a number of ways, um, looking from anything from anterior chamber angle, to uh, help us make a decision on if this angle is occludable or not, uh, to uh, K-max and hyperprolate corneas and also ab other abnormal corneal features uh, that may suggest things like ectasia or keratoconus. We're also familiar with looking at densitometry in the lens, and, and this is also quite useful when we're trying to make a determination on the different stages of dysfunctionality with the lens, uh, particularly as we move into the second stage where we find some early opacities, and the third stage, uh, which is equivalent to a cataract. 
We can also utilize this in the cornea to give us corneal information for corneal opacities as well. And here's just an example of defining the edge of a LASIK flap uh, with uh, the densitometry map for the cornea. These are fully customizable and uh, with, with a lot of flexibility uh, and allow us to optimize and, and tailor it really to our use depending on our clinic flow and what type of patients that we typically see or may be seeing at that time. And here's just an example of uh, a uh, what may be considered a form Frust keratoconus or uh, with a um, posterior float that's on the borderline or just beyond uh, normal limits. Well, how do we use this for uh, in our premium well selection? This is a, a, a robust tool that incorporates a lot of useful information into a, a single device. This has a, a, a Zerna key derivation, which allows for uh, essentially understanding without a true Shack Hartman wavefront aberrometer as a second device, essentially a mathematical derivation of, uh, of, of the, the full spectrum of Zernike coefficients. How is that important in uh, refractive cataract surgery? Well, we want to understand what it, our spherical aberration profiles are and other hardware operations such as uh, coma and trefoil. This can help us make a better decision in terms of IOL selection when we look at the different spherical aberration uh, um, designs and uh, amounts in matching the internal lens with the external lens or the cornea. Well, what about presbyopia correcting IOLs such as diffractive bifocal lenses and um, or extended depth of focus lenses? Well, historically, uh, it's it's um, been said um, by, uh, by by Jack Holiday and others that. Ideally, we want to have a, a 0.3 or less RMS, root mean square, of total higher aberrations uh, for di diffractive uh, bifocal lens technology. And I think that's a sound rule, particularly with that technology, as there is a, a, a contrast sensitivity hit when we split light. Also, what about uh, this term cord mu? This was a term that, um, that uh, we coined and published which was a clinically relevant uh, description of centration and the disparity between the center of the entrance pupil and uh, the, the corneal vertex in a subject fixated manner. The Penicam allows for the measurement of cord mu and actually has it displayed in the different uh, um, lens selection pages. And toric assessment is also very useful. This does a real-time measurement of, of uh, the anterior and posterior corneal contribution, which we do have available in other devices, but this is different in that it also demonstrates magnitude and orientation of the posterior corneal astigmatism and does so in a way that is making us really rethink how we're evaluating posterior corneal astigmatism. And this has uh, been studied and, and published in, um, in large series. So here's the printout of the Pentacam AXL. And this, uh, at a glance, provides a lot of intuitive and useful information. Um, for example, here's our total corneal spherical aberration for this particular eye. Uh, and this goes on to show what's now been updated as cord mu. Uh, historically, this was had been um, similarly described as angle kappa. Uh, and then we can look at total corneal, corneal higher order aberrations as well. Of course, we have the anterior surface Ks, the total corneal power, uh, which in the four, four millimeter zone in this case, shows us both the anterior and the posterior corneal contribution and uh, allows for us to make decisions in accounting for example, against the rule of corneal astigmatism uh, where we would want to treat more aggressively uh, to account for this drift over um, uh, uh, time. Let's look at a couple examples here and, and see how we've utilized this in our clinic. This is a 60-year-old uh, female 
uh, who presented after myopic LASIK um, over uh, 15 years ago. And it's looking uh, like most of our refractive cataract patients these days for um, improvement in distance and also reading vision. Uh, currently in the right eye, um, she's minus one, and in the left uh, with a, a large myopic shift, minus 575 with minimal cell, and her right eye is dominant. And she has uh, two to three plus nuclear sclerosis in the right and three plus in the left, respectively. Now, when we look at this report um, from our AXL, uh, this, again, at a glance, and this is one of the holiday reports, gives us some very useful information, and, and um, starting with the axial um, and um, sagittal curvature in the top left. Now, this looks like a fairly typical post-myopic patient here, and um, with what I call, you know, reasonably regular, irregular astigmatism, irregular by definition, since she's had LASIK previously, but it's, um, but it, this is, this is still not wildly, wildly irregular. This can all be accentuated with the tangential curvature map. Uh, and then we obviously can look at thickness, relative pachymetry, and elevation uh, floats for the front and back respectively. Now, Dr. Holliday um, has uh, had, in his last update, has proposed an optical, optimized optical zone uh, that kind of through his years of research and working with uh, Oculus and the scientists at Oculus, it's found really to be the most robust um, uh, zonal analysis, keratometric analysis that is optimized uh, for post-refractive eyes. And he calls this the uh, EKR65. The EKR65 is essentially the equivalent K readings um, is the EKR. <clears throat> the 65 is a, essentially a smoothing of the zonal analysis that takes out the outliers. Well, essentially what Dr. Holliday did was he picked the flattest 65% of the power distribution in a 4.5 millimeter optical zone. And, and, and again, he felt that the 4.5 millimeter optical zone really was the most useful for most comers. Now, if you have a patient with a particularly small pupil, then you, we can actually look at the different zonal analyses to evaluate that and really customize it based on their effective optical zones as defined by their, by their pupil diameter. But for most comers, uh, Dr. Holliday found this to be best. Now, why did he pick the flattest 65%? Well, essentially, the, when, prior to this, just looking purely at a zonal analysis, you would get these peaks and troughs that would throw off the measurements and end up um, with a, a steeper K and therefore a more hyperopic outcome and surprise, which we all know can be more difficult to enhance if we need to. So by doing a smoothing effect and accounting for these outliers, and we'll kind of go over this in a little more detail here in a minute, he essentially allowed for the the calling for a calculation of a, a, a slightly higher powered IOL, which ends up in a slightly more myopic result, and that essentially avoids the the, high, the hyperopic surprise. So when we look at this, we can look at the EKR65. Still gives the flat and the steep in these zones. It gives the mean, which is um, typically what we're going to be using, but it gives us more information as well. Um, which is, can, uh, is quite useful, such as cord mu and, um, and, the, and, and the like. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to just minimize my screen here for a second. And I'm going to, um, because I'm going to hide something so that I can see the full screen, because I want to point out here on the upper right um, this. This was, to the best of my knowledge, the first time this has been done in a diagnostic advice, which Jack used essentially uh, the, um, the back to front um, corneal ratio of um, radius of curvature, and, and based off of a normal distribution of about 82%, uh, he developed uh, the math model 
to estimate based off of the to tomographic uh, um, changes, the an estimated refractive change, and therefore an estimated, um, uh, well, let me say it in a different way, the pre-op Ks. So I just want you to think about that for a second. Essentially what he's doing is he's estimating the pre-op Ks in a calculation real time without having the pre-op information, which we all know that we rarely have. And from there, he could go on to estimate the refractive change. So all of a sudden, at a click, we've got that math done for us real time. And that's, that's quite useful. The other information on here are the total uh, spherical aberration. So we can see this is not surprisingly an oblate cornea after a myopic LASIK with anticipated positive spherical aberration, then it's significant. Um, 0.6 RMS is a significant amount. And it's in fact, if you look, it's accounting for the vast majority of the total higher order aberrations of the cornea of 0.668. And then lastly, the cord mu value here is quite small uh, over in the, in the right. And that's um, typical of a, uh, of, a, of a moderate to low to moderate myope uh, where we really don't see the large cord mu values. Now, let's move on to the um, additional readout here of the additional holiday report that shows us the different zonal analyses. For example, if we wanted to look at and zoom in on different zonal analyses, um, but this essentially is at the, when we do the smoothing effect, this is the case that we get. But if you draw your attention to the bottom left and these spikes, those are the spikes that I'm talking about that are the outliers that can throw off your calculations if we don't smooth that out. So this is just essentially a profile of the distribution in, um, defined by your zone of the um, equivalent K readings. And that's how Jack came, out, came up with this um, and, and uh, has, has proved to be quite useful. Now, here's um, what we ended up doing with this patient. Um, we decided um, to uh, pr proceed with laser-assisted cataract surgery um, utilizing a femto-assistant uh, limbal relaxing incisions to address the small amount of um, astigmatism in a large optical zone outside the LASIK flap, uh, utilizing intraoperative aberrometry, and an extended depth of focus intraocular lens. Uh, this is something that we've been utilizing um, uh, for most comers uh, in uh, post-myopic uh, uh, LASIK and laser vision correction. Why do we utilize uh, a, um, uh, the Technus lens in this case is because it's the highest negatively spherical aberrated IOL available in the market in the US. And this allows us to, to match uh, or closely match as much as possible the corneal contribution that I just demonstrated to you based on the uh, holiday readings. Our target's plain now. So when we do our traditional post-refractive calculations, in, in our center, we use just about every device available and then take a weighted mean to make our decisions. Here, if we just run through a sample of these, we can see that based on the ASCRS um, uh, printout, it's calling for an 18 diopter lens. So when we look at the um, Pentacam AXL post-refractive IOL calculations in the right eye, with no prior history, we have a couple calculators to choose from, the Hillpop and Shamus, uh, and also the Barrett True K, which um, has proven to be an excellent post-refractive calculator without prior information. And what is it calling for without pre-refractive Ks, um, which again, we rarely have. Well, one calls for a 19 and one calls for an 18. Huh, okay, so which do we pick? Well. Let's pull forward our, the pre the estimated and calculated pre-refractive Ks based on uh, the holiday software. Well, um, here we are. So this is estimating prior refractive uh, um, surgery. It was 44.9. Well, that's useful, but what do we do with it? Well, Pentacam has incorporated a number of the double K formulas that allow us now real time to incorporate and automate this pre-refractive estimate. And let's see what happens when we compare our calculators. Well, again, here are two um, that 
do not require the historical information. And let's look at a couple of the double K formulas that do require the, um, the prior refractive Ks that we would not otherwise have. And they're calling for 18. So there's strong agreement here with Barrett True K. Well, we perform intraoperative aberrometry on our post-refractive patients and performed a pilot study comparing this to the uh, Penicam AXL using this holiday software to see uh, wh how, what was the correlation. Well, let me just show you a couple of these examples. So when we look at the aura, um, it was essentially suggesting somewhere between an 18 and an 18.5. And so in, in this, we've selected an 18.5. And if we run down and compare what an 18.5 would look like with the Barrett True K and some of these double Ks, it's pretty amazing when you see how tight this is. I mean, two of the three were, were within 0 0.05 diopters of the same of intraoperative aberrometry utilizing this software. And, and that's, um, that's uh, uh, quite remarkable. This patient went on to uh, be right on the money and just do fabulous. Um, and, uh, um, and so that was kind of our glimpse into, well, you know what? That's, I wonder just how important the intraoperative aberrometry is. Well, let's look at our uh, fellow Y. Here's the equivalent K readings in the uh, uh, 65 at the 4.5 millimeter optical zone. Again, a lot of positive spherical aberration. Uh, you can see what the estimated pre-refractive Ks were, 45.2 with about a 2.8 myopic um, ablation, according to this. Minimal cord mu, um, quality scans look good. And um, and again, this is a this is a, um, a somewhat of a um, starting to get a little bit on the irregular side here um, in terms of uh, the uh, symmetry of the cornea. Now, when we look at the distribution here, you can see some peaks and troughs, and that correlates pretty well with the asymmetry and the irregular astigmatism here. And those are the watchouts. That's what really can throw off some of your zonal analyses, like we talked about. So with the sixty five percent, the flattest 65 percent of the power distribution in that 4.5 millimeter optical zone, we get a nice smoothing effect that really accounts for some of those blips. And, um, and so here, when we look at what our current uh, steep and flat Ks and our mean uh, Ks would be, um, then that, that um, makes sense. So again, same plan. Uh, we utilized the most negative spherical IOL, um, aberrated IOL that we had, which was a, a Technus platform. And this patient was highly motivated um, for a, um, a presbyopia correcting lens. And uh, here we targeted plan note, but if anything, this is the non-dominant eye. I wanted to err a little bit and just a smidgen towards my, a little bit of myopia if needed. So this was calling for a 19 diopter lens with the ASCRS calculator. When we look at um, what the uh, the two available formulae that do not require historical information gave us essentially one's calling for a 19.5 the Hilphoff and Chamas, but the Barrett True K is calling for an 18.5 which matches um, and the again the ASURS was right in between. Okay, great. So which one do we use? Well, we got three choices. Let's pull forward our pre-refractive Ks. Uh, as estimated by the holiday power, and see what our double Ks will give us here. Um, here's our two formula we just showed you. Let's use the double K, the holiday, and a second double K. And again, all agree perfectly with the Barrett True K. So that gives us a lot of confidence moving into surgery that 18.5 um, is, is a good choice. Well, what does Aura tell us? Uh, in, in our pilot study, um, the suggested power was also 18.5, which agreed with all four other measurements. And we wanted to err just a little bit on the myopic side to get a little more oomph here uh, for her non-dominant eye for the reading. And, um, and if we look and cross-reference what a 19 would have given us, um, here with the Barrett True K and the two double Ks, um, again, look, look at the correlation. It's astounding. Aura predicted a minus 0 0.35 diopters. The Barrett True K minus 0 0.35. The Holiday Double K minus 0 0.36. And the Double K SRKT minus 0 
within 0 0.06 diopters of prediction. And this is where we really start saying, wow, again, do we really need the extra time and expense uh, for intraoperative agarometry? It's always nice when we have the reassurance, but this is more and more matching up beautifully. And again, a, a great result um, where, where uh, fortunately all these calculations worked and made sense. I want to shift gears a little bit to a different type of um, post-refractive situation. Well, here's a lady who was status post hyperopic LASIK 10 years ago, and not surprisingly wants everything, improvement in both distance and reading uh, without glasses. Here's her current manifest, looks pretty good actually, um, and, and right eye dominant, but with appreciable nuclear sclerosis and poor quality vision. So make no mistake, this patient was, was um, was complaining of um, poor quality vision and it had diminished over time and clearly with, with cataracts that were um, ready for uh, extraction. Well, let's look at our holiday report. Uh, a, a, a familiar post hyperopic central elevation in a what we term a hyperprolate shape. And this is often mistaken for ectasia after LASIK. And ectasia can occur after hyperopic LASIK, ladies and gentlemen, but m more times than not, this is a, a, a typical hyperprolate uh, LASIK ablation um, that we're observing. When we look at the bottom left, the tangential will always accentuate and help us look at what we're, what we're seeing. But it can be useful because when we essentially zoom in on these changes, you, you can start to see, you know what, this is, has some symmetry to it uh, that um, I wonder if we can use that to our advantage. Uh, here, corneal thickness maps uh, make sense. The front and back elevations also make sense. But let's zoom in on some of the detail. Let's look at our EKR 65 readings in the 4.5 millimeter optical zone. And um, here, not surprisingly, we have a, a, a steep cornea with a, a highly negative Q value. So the more negative, the more prolate and now hyperprolate this is, the more positive, the more oblate or flatter that the cornea is. And that correlates well with um, sphericity, and it's a description of sphericity in the six millimeter optical zone, but this also correlates well with spherical aberration. So what kind of spherical aberration do we get after hyperopic LASIK? Well, this tells you a negative spherical aberration. In fact, this is highly negative spherical aberration, minus 0 0.65 uh, microns, a root mean square of spherical aberration. And, um, and, and that's important. And you can also see that the back to front ratio has now been uh, inverted. So it's actually essentially a higher ratio due to the hyperprolate nature of steepening the cornea. Well, in Jack's calculator, he can estimate the pre-refractive case to be relatively normal around 43 diopters and the refractive change of about a three diopter hyperopic LASIK. Now look at cord mu. So when I described cord mu in our paper on um, on centration, the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2015, this was merely an attempt to determine a clinically relevant method of of, of, of understanding centration and utilizing it um, in, intraoperatively. And when we start to see higher degrees of cord mu, this is in hyperopic. Um, eyes because these eyes tend to be shorter. Therefore, the macula and the fovea in particular are swung more temporal. And there's a mismatch if you ray trace the fovea to a point source of light and with during fi subject fixation, which creates a disparity between where that corneal reflex would end up on the cornea in a subject fixated manner and the entrance of the uh, center of the entrance pupil. Now, this is where we need to pay attention to some degree due to potential mismatches of centration. And why is that important? Because it's been shown and demonstrated by uh, uh, Paul Ernst recently and published that this can lead to internal coma if we don't pay attention uh, to centration. And uh, now let's look at this in some different zonal analyses. Um, 
again, using the 4.5 millimeter optical zone <clears throat> and smoothing for some of these peaks and troughs, you can see what the mean um, uh, keratometric value would be of essentially 46 diopters. And again, you can customize this depending on um, uh, pupil sizes, depending on radial uh, um, uh, keratometry, uh, um, um, uh, incisions, um, highly irregular corneas, that allows a lot of flexibility. So what's our surgical plan here? Well, what we want to use, we don't want to compound the spherical aberration, negative spherical aberration. We want to use it to our advantage here if we can. And so we, we've um, um, uh, published in a number of abstracts utilizing negative spherical aberration in the cornea with an aberration-free IOL to extend depth of focus as a presbyopia correcting strategy. And that's exactly what we attempted to do here. And this is essentially a pseudo accommodation strategy. So we knew the negative corneal spherical aberration that we were working with. And we were going to um, create an extended depth of focus circumstance by by employing negative spherical aberration as described by Carolini Rocha. And by utilizing this, we, um, we give a little bit of a fudge factor, somewhere between minus 0.3 to 0.5 diopters as a target to ensure that we're gonna um, uh, get our, our, um, an, a, some robust reading, but still maintain distance. But when we run our, um, our hyperopic calculations, this is calling for a 19.5 diopter lens in our ASCS calculator. And when we run the um, uh, hyperopic uh, calculator for um, without pre-refractive Ks, essentially our, um, our Barrett True K is giving us a minus 0.3 diopter, 20 diopter lens. So, so far 19.5 and 20 diopters. Now, what if we uh, pull forward our estimated and calculated pre-refractive Ks and put these in, and now let's look at some of our double Ks. We're gonna use three double Ks here. We're gonna use the Hoffer Q double K, the Holiday One double K, and then the SRQ double K. And look at this, excellent correlation with the Barrett True K. So again, three of four are telling us 20 diopter lens, which gives us um, a lot of comfort um, using a very small amount of negative to focus, lower to focus uh, to try to optimize our um, reading outcome. So our aura, let's look and see what an aura recommended. Well, a 20 um, summer uh, was suggested, and I aired a little bit more on the myopic side um, knowing that she had a really steep cornea to start with, I was not going to want to um, do any sort of hyperopic enhancement, and that would be a big no-no. Um, so if anything, in this case, I'm actually going to air just a little bit more myopic. And let's just kind of plug this in retrospectively and see what this would have given us. So Barrett True K is, is, is giving a, um, a slightly more myopic outcome. And when we look at the, double, the different double Ks, these are all agreeing. So this is, um, and so in, in retrospect, you know, a 20 would probably would have been a great lens to go with, um, but I'm always airing a little bit um, more myopic in, an, um, in, a, in a highly high, uh, hyperprolate cornea. And post-op, this patient actually did quite well. Um, ended up um, uh, a, a little myopic as we intended, um, but with excellent um, reading vision and um, and still very, very good distance vision, but a wonderful subjective outcome with a monofocal aberration-free lens. So in summary, the, the holiday reports are an incredibly useful tool in our toolbox for the post-refractive IOL patient. And essentially, with the, the, the new calculation with the EKR65, this prov provides really um, perhaps the most robust optical zonal analysis for total corneal power in these post-refractive eyes. Now also in the holiday software, the estimated pre-refractive Ks can be utilized directly into the AXL post-refractive double K formulas, which gives you a lot of confidence moving in 
And frankly, ladies and gentlemen, may uh, help us not need additional diagnostics, um, which require more time and expense. And this is just really kind of challenging how we think about this uh, to streamline our workflow and our intraoperative time. The corneal, corneal total spherical aberration is calculated, and we advocate matching this to the spherical aberration profile of the IOL. But you can, all, and you, as you've seen in these pseudo accommodative approaches, or uh, um, we can actually utilize some of that to our advantage if we do this uh, sensibly. And 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 court mu is provided for proper candidacy evaluation and uh, potentially centration of diffractive presbyopia correcting out IOLs. So. With that, um, what I want to do is I'm going to um, want to come back out uh, here and I'm going to open this up for questions and um, hand the reins back over to um, to Chris uh, as our moderator. And um, Chris, right now I'm not seeing. Um, there we go. That's perfect. And yeah. let me do one more thing. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ware. So uh, yeah, uh, my my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, and and uh, for all of the, you in attendance, again, uh, thank thank you for being here, and we'll we'll get to some questions. Uh, just to remind you, on your go to webinar screen, you actually have a text box for questions. If you enter them in right now, I'll be able to to read them off uh, to Dr. Waring. Um, if you missed part of the webinar, uh, we, you will be getting a recording tomorrow on that. If you have any questions about the Pinacam or uh, the webinar tonight, you're welcome to contact us at the. 800 numbers shown there on the screen, or you can email us, email us at sales at oculususa.com. We also have uh, prior webinars that we've done like this on our website at www.oculususa.com. So I'll just go ahead and get into the questions. Um, uh, one of the first questions here is, in cases where the true K and the double K method with estimated pre-surgical Ks don't agree, which one would you go with? I would err towards the estimated pre-surgical K. Okay. Now, but remember, these are going to be, um, uh, and I'm going to qualify that a little bit. So if we're talking about, when you say the true K, remember, there is the true K total, there's the total cornea power. That's on um, the Pentacam, but that's different than the Barrett true K. Now, um, as you can see, they tend to line up pretty well. And often you may you have at your disposal um, four, three or four different uh, double K methods, but the nice thing about that is, and and if you go back to the original papers, the the double K um, in, in the original um, analysis, the, the the historic information typically leads to the best results. Now the reality is we usually don't have the historic information. So this is not something that we're evaluating often um, in some of the more current literature. And that's where the Barrett true K really, really, really shines. So um, this is usually not a binary decision point. It's a multifactorial decision point. And that's where an aura can be quite useful. And um, despite my prior comments, this is something that really can still help us as a tiebreaker. Also, if we have to think about what type of cornea are and post-refractive treatment are we doing? So in the case of a post-hyperopic LASIK patient, as you've seen, then if I was split between those two, I would give the one with a higher power IOL that would give a more myopic result. Okay. Um, so next, next question here, how about post-RK cases? Uh, the the post-RK cases, what we do is a, a little bit different. Um, this can still be quite useful um, for post-RK, but you want to take this obviously with more grain, more of a grain of salt. You're going to want to use post-RK calculators specifically, and not use post-myopic or, or obviously post-hyperopic LASIK calculators first off. Number two, the there are post-RK calculators available on the AXL, which allow you to utilize that specifically. Number three, we have a, um, a, a, a sort of a nomogram that we have not validated, but that, we've, um, that we utilize 
um, and, and, and have developed over the years, where we add an additional myopic target based on the series of cuts. So that is to say, if somebody has a four cut RK, um, we may go uh, uh, somewhere between zero to, to about a minus a quarter um, or minus 0.3 diopters um, of our, for our target. For an eight cut, maybe somewhere between minus 0.3 to minus 0.5 and 0.6. For a 16 cut, about minus 0.9. So we're adding about a thir minus 0.3 diopters to each series of cuts. In addition to that, often these are long eyes, so you have to account for a long eye calculation, whether this is a Wang Cook Maloney or uh, whether this is um, one of the advanced formulae that account for that automatically, such as um, Barrett um, and or, or the Hill RBF. So you want to make sure that you're accounting for these three things all, all individually. But um, and then lastly, you want to use available post RK calculators such as the ASCRS uh, post RK um, with that selected. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so the next question here, how do you use the Pentacam AXL for post refractive toric IOL calculation? Um, that's, a, um, that's a good question. So essentially, we, you, you think of this like any calculate, um, IOL calculation, you're now trying to fix two things, right? You're trying to fix the sphere and, and cylinder. And so you think of them individually. So um, it all, everything applies exactly as I just taught you over the last half an hour uh, for the spherical component, exactly the same. And then for the torque calculation, this actually has a torque calculator and a torque planner uh, within the software. So now we have a, a second decision-making process based on the anterior curvature of the posterior corneal astigmatism um, and the orientation of the astigmatism. So from there, it's just all the teachings from Doug Koch and others about accounting for posterior corneal astigmatism. Uh, and effectively, um, if we have 0.7 diopters or more against the rule, then we're going to utilize a toric. If we have 1.4 diopters um, or more with the rule, we're going to use the toric. So we're treating with the rule um, about um, half as aggressively against the rule, about twice as aggressively. And this, again, this allows to, uh, this accounts for the drift over time. Now, the one thing that the AXL um, uh, that we're learning more and more about is the impact of the orientation of the posterior cornea. And it, and it turns out that based on the um, uh, studies done with AXL, the withdrawal posterior and anterior cornea orientation tend to agree pretty well. Um, and, and typically, you know, about more than 80% 80, 80 of the cases. Um, oblique, or, or, or I think it's actually more than 90%. Oblique, now we drop down to um, something like six, uh, 60 to 70%. And against the rules, as can be um, closer to 50 to 60%, where we can make some determination and predict the orientation of the posterior corneal contribution. So it's um, according to the data um, that we're seeing from AXL, it actually is the orientation of posterior cornea is something we need to be looking at more carefully. Okay, thank you. And, and the AXL gives us that information. So uh, just a couple more questions. This is a, a little bit off topic, but um, may, maybe you can answer it anyway. Um, is traditional corneal topography still needed when using the Pinacam for toric IOLs? Um, the answer is no. Um, it's useful, and each different type of topographer provides different information. And remember, the AXL, the Pentacam, is a high-resolution tomographer. So it's actually, its curvature is actually derived from elevation mathematically. But it gives you central uh, information that a placido-based topographer doesn't. And that extrapolates. So, um, but placido-based has been long considered the gold standard. 
Um, and uh, however, is much, much, much more subject to uh, cheer film irregularities since that's how it works. So in our practice, we've actually streamlined our flow so that we're only using the Pentacam AXL in our workups, but for years have used multiple devices. We've just found that it's not necessary um, and that this streamlines our workflow tremendously. Okay, and so I think I have the, the last question here. Um, and I, I may chime in on this just a little bit if that's okay with you, Dr. Waring. Uh, but the question is, what value of RMS would you avoid the Symphony IOL? Well, I'm assuming this is higher order aberration RMS value. Would you avoid the Symphony IOL? Well? Your cases showed RMS values well over 0 0.45, and apparently they did well. One thing uh, that I wanted to chime in on that about is that um, depending on where you're actually looking in the software, the calculation zone uh, for this is, is a little different. So if you're looking in the holiday report, for example, uh, it uses a, a wider calculation zone and the guidelines are a little different. Um, if you're looking at the IOL calculator printout, it's uh, a smaller calculation zone. So on the IOL calculator, it's a four millimeter calculation zone. On the um, holiday report, it's a six millimeter calculation zone. They're very similar schools of thought, but again, because you're using a larger calculation zone, you're going to, to get a higher um, RMS value. And so again, the guidelines are a little differently. Maybe you, Dr. Waring, you can just um, explain what you use as far as your guidelines, um, as far as higher order aberrations and multifocal or extended depth of focus IOLs. Sure. Well, first off, I um, thank you for asking the question. Uh, and number two, the um, most people um, in, in studies, we when we look at aberrometry, we're often using sort of four millimeters as a as a reference point, uh, and this is. Um, but it's important not to compare apples and oranges in the two different reports. So, Chris, thank you for pointing that out. The 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 answer is we need to qualify the question. That is to say, um, we don't think of RMS total when we make these decisions, and this is just our practice pattern. We have to think of the individual contribution of the di different uh, Zernike coefficient. What am I talking about? Well, coma contribution may have a completely different impact than spherical aberration contribution. And in fact, you, we can have as much positive spherical aberration as you want, then you can use a the most negatively aspheric IOL available, which is a technus platform. So that's going to work in your favor if we're just talking about, say, a large myopic ablation, um, regardless of the total amount. Now that's different if we have a large positive, um, sorry, a large negative spherical aberration um, value from the cornea, such as the hyperprolate cornea I, I, I presented. <clears throat> um, the optical quality breaks down really fast when we compound negative spherical aberration. And that's where an aberration-free neutral lens would be used with any hyperprolate um, formation, meaning anything really greater than um, uh, a plus uh, 1.5 plus 0.2 RMS. And frankly, you could just even look at the topographer, and if you start to see the central hyperprolate button, you actually don't need a um, a, an, a Hartman aberrometer or even um, the uh, Pentacam um, to do the math, you can make a qualitative assessment, but it's much more meaningful if you do, can do it quantitatively by looking at the data that's displayed in the AXL on the holiday report. And that allows you to, to, to match much, um, much more accurately as well. But if we look at coma, coma is where things start to get tricky. And this is where we have essentially decentered um, spherical aberration. And this is uh, where, if you can, again, if you can see it on the map, that's where we start to shy away from presbyopia or correcting lenses, particularly if you have a larger contribution um, in that area. So the um, one last um, point here is that you, we can't lump um, EDOF and, and um, multifocal, so that they're completely different. The EDOF has essentially the same contrast sensitivity as a monofocal lens. 
And therefore, it really is our one of our go-to lenses in the post-myopic and post-RK eyes that have re relatively regular optical zones. Uh, but this is um, not the case for post-hyperopic LASIK patients where we use an aberration-free lens uh, and where we want to um, uh, utilize and not compound the spherical aberration. Okay. Uh, so uh, that does it for questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sticking around and for, for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Waring, uh, for that presentation. That was excellent. And for sticking around in the added discussion at the end. Uh, so uh, that, that'll do it for tonight. So again, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Dr. Waring. And everybody have a good night. Thank you all uh, for your time and interest. And thanks, Chris, very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Good night now. Good night.